Failure is a step to success. Falling down is a step to success. Losing is a step to success. Pain is a step to success. But quitting is not. Never give up on what you really want to do. This is the instinct that says you've had enough. This is the instinct that says you've, you've, you've given it your best shot. You can, you can stand down. You can back off. You can take a knee. Don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you're done. We are relentless. We are powerful. We are forward thinkers. We are the generation of hard workers, innovators, and creators. And we are the ones who never give up, never surrender, and never quit on our goals. This is the instinct that says, you can rest now. Do not listen to that instinct. Do not listen. That instinct is a liar and wants to bring you down. You don't judge a person by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience. You judge them by where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. When you work for something, it gives you a different type of attachment to it. The harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. As long as we're willing to put the work in, we will get there in the end. As long as we never quit. This is all about the quitting mind. So what's the quitting mind? Let's say it's day one of a job interview. We all know what that fucking shit feels like. You have your clothes laid out, you got your fucking food ready to go in the morning, you've been preparing for weeks and weeks and weeks. You show up and you bring your best self. You get the fucking job. Merry fucking Christmas. All right. After a couple months, you start showing up to work a little later. You don't look as good. Your clothes aren't fucking laid out. Your breakfast isn't ready. Your mind's getting softer. We do that shit with everything in life. When New Year's coming up, guess what? Don't have a fucking quitting mind. Repetition every day, stay hard. And if you ain't got more heart than me, if you ain't been working harder than me, if you ain't sacrificed more than me, I'm gonna destroy you and I'm not retreating. I'm not running. I don't care what they say on paper. I don't care how many games you won. I don't care if you say we outnumbered. We live by this and we die by this. We don't retreat. We don't run. Every man must search his own soul. The biggest battle you will fight is with yourself. This battle will never go away. It's a fight you will have to battle for the rest of your life. You are the only person that can get yourself back up, but you're also the only person that can lie down and allow yourself to be defeated. Don't fail yourself today. Quitting is never an option. Don't fail yourself today. Because it's so many of our limitations are self-imposed, mm -hmm. you know? And we set, we set something up in our brain, we program our brain one way, and that's our limit. And until we can get past that and see what we're really made of and like get uncomfortable and experience pain, mm -hmm. you can't real, you don't really don't know what you're capable of. When you feel you've exhausted every option, remember you haven't. If I could count the amount of times I was told no, though I created the mentality in my head of taking no as no, not right now, not no, this isn't for you. If I had given up after the first time I had said no, I wouldn't be here. And so it just, you know, not letting someone dictate your future. If you believe in something so strongly and you want to do something so strongly, who's going to tell you to not do it? There's never a, a failure unless you quit. So if you keep going, there's not a failure. Just keep changing and moving. The person with big dreams is more powerful than the person with all the facts. But it's not so much about the opposition and the adversity that we face as it is about the perspective that we have about the opposition and the adversity that we face. Meaning perspective drives performance every day of the week. How you view what you do will always affect how you do what you do. Don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you are done. Once a quitter, always a quitter. Prove them wrong. You are relentless. You will never stop. This isn't a game to you. This is life or death. People don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. 
Character supersedes talent every day of the week. No retreat, no surrender. We live and we die by this. Every man must search his own soul. At a certain point, don't let your actions betray your words. You are not going to give up because of a little pain. You won't quit because of a bad situation. It isn't in your nature to give up on this. You don't stop when you're tired. You stop when you're done. You stop when you get the job done. You finish when you have done enough work to make progress. A little pain along the way is your rite of passage. It is the battle scars of the successful, the marks of a warrior who succeed at this adventure through life. What will your scars say about you? How many battles will you pull through to come out the other side a winner? Come out the other side an ultimate version of yourself. Never give up on what you really want to do. And they'll say it's not your fault. And they'll tell you it's okay to stop. It's okay to settle. It's okay to give up. And that is the instinct you need to fight. You need to push back to smash into the ground. Do not take the easy way out. You think that successful people have some lucky charm. Well, let me tell you something. I woke up this morning and I couldn't find my fucking lucky charm. I and other successful people wake up every day doing the same thing, fighting fighting back against the distractions, the fears, the doubts. Do not give up based on instinct. If you are forced to stand down, to retreat, so that you can rebuild and re-attack, so be it. And we learn over time, we build into a habit to spend more time having control instead of more time being out of control. It does matter. But make that decision based on logic, not on the instinct of surrender and defeat. Opposition, adversity, challenge. Never forget why you do what you do. I'm not talking about college. I'm not talking about when you first got to the league and you got drafted. I'm talking about when you was coming up and you was in the street or you was at the park and your mom had to go sacrifice and work so you get your pair of cleats. I'm talking about that bite because everybody don't remember that. Your will and desire to win are greater than anybody else's. I know you are aware of how bad you want this. I know you are aware of what you would give to succeed. I know you want this. I know it is all you want. I know what you would give for this. So do it. Show it. Prove it. Show the world. Show them that anything you can dream of can become your reality. Success is getting back up and learning from these falls, learning from the pain and the losses. Success lies in getting back to your feet and trying again. I was just a young kid with a dream and a belief in himself. And for many times I was laughed at and not believed in, but you know what? Nothing external can, can, can defeat the internal. The only yes. thing that can take someone down or break you down is internal. Nothing external is strong enough. It's just about making sure your internal dialogue and your internal belief in yourself is strong enough that it can withstand the external. The external is there. You've got to accept it. You've got to embrace it. You've got to understand it and be aware of it. But don't let it seep into, you, into your internal dialogue. Don't fail yourself today. 
for most people, man, you could be great, but you haven't even pulled a strip off to activate it, right? Like you can be great, but you're living on reserve, right? You didn't, you didn't empty the bucket, right? You didn't give everything you had to every aspect of your life. Like for most people, they're great professionally, but they end up becoming a public success and behind closed doors, they're private failure. Not because they don't have the talent or the skill set, they don't have the character, right? That they can apply it and be consistent in every aspect of their life and empty out everything they got to everything, right? Of course, you don't just give everything you got all the time, right? You get to a point where you learn to be efficient and effective in every aspect of your life. And for most people, it's not a problem of skill set. It's a problem of character. And empty the bucket is having the right character to be consistent and empty out everything you got in every aspect of your life. There was a lot of moments in my life to where it was people that saw things in me that I couldn't see in myself. And they believed in me in a way that I couldn't believe in myself yet. And I rented their level of belief until I got strong enough to possess my own. Right, it's like when you're young and they see you, and it's like even when you start out doing what you're doing, you could be talented, right? And somebody older than you or more experienced than you can see you and know like, oh man, if he did this or if he does this, man, he could be great, right? And they can come to you and say, hey kid, man, you got something. Like, you could be great, right? Like my teachers and my coaches, when they came to me and they were like, son, I'm telling you, like, you could go to college, man. Like you really, I know you're talking about it, but your circumstances are saying different. I think you can do it, right? And when they said it, I'm like, oh, I can, I can do it. Like I can make it happen. Because they're believing in me making it happen. I think I can do it. Like I think when you show people things, that's powerful. I think exposure sparks inspiration, right? Exposure sparks motivation. And my mindset can never go back to the way that it once was because I have been exposed to something different, to something new. And so I think belief and exposure are two of the most powerful things that can happen to a person. Like when you're young or when you do something and you're a novice, right? And you start out doing it and you might think you can do something with it or you might not. You might do it and it's being driven by your passion. And then somebody comes along that's a little bit older or even more experienced and they can see it in a way that you can't see it. Right. And so I think it's important with belief, because if a person believes in you in a way that you don't believe in yourself, you can rent that person's belief until you get strong enough to possess your own. Right. And you use that person's belief to fuel you every single day. Right. Because you can have a level of belief with what you're doing. But you can go back to a certain set of circumstances that tell you, nah, it's not going to happen. And so you rent that person's belief until you get strong enough to possess your own. I firmly believe every person's purpose is tied to somebody else's purpose and destiny. And so your purpose, my purpose is tied to somebody else. Like when I speak, when I do what I do, like people say, oh, man, man I really needed to hear that. Right. That helped me do this that helped get me through this, that helped me with this. That's my purpose being tied to other people's purpose, destiny, beliefs, and dreams. That's the power and magic of purpose, right? I don't think it can be a purpose without being tied to other people's purpose, destiny, dreams, and aspirations, right? I think that's the power in it, but realizing it is another thing. The only thing I felt I had the advantage in my whole life was my work ethic. And I took pride in that, right? I was never the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, never had the most resources, but I had a work ethic. I think what's most important is when we go through something, what's the perspective that we have of it, right? Because for most people, when you go through something, the person's natural perspective is, okay, what did I lose, right? What happened to me? Like I took a loss, right? People never look at it and say, okay, man, tell me what did you gain, right? Even though I know it hurt, you didn't want to go through it, but look at it in a way to where you can say, what's the lesson in this, right? What would you say life is trying to teach you from dealing with this? And I firmly believe the quicker you can shift your perspective from yourself 
to others, when you're in the midst of adversity, the quicker you'll get through it. I think, um, I think having a purpose is that thing that, that makes us tick, that gets us up every day and gets us over the hump of opposition and adversity. And the reason that I champion adversity and opposition is because I think for the most part in life, people pretty much know what to do when things go right, right? Like when things go right, they know how to feel, they know how to act, how to react. But it's when that opposition and that adversity comes and it creates a level of misunderstanding, right? Now the vision is blurred. Now you don't have clarity about what you're supposed to do. Now you question if your existence matters. And I think when you have a purpose, it's powerful because in the midst of the opposition, it makes you realize that you've been put here for a certain reason. This too shall pass, right? And the reason I would say that is, um, like I said, I champion adversity, right? We know what to do when things go right. But the next time it gets tough, uh, the next time you question your purpose, the next time you question your existence, uh, your mission, if you're supposed to be doing what you're doing, and it gets tough and challenging, just whisper to yourself, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. If you actually want something, you can have it. You have to treat yourself like you matter. Because if you don't, then you don't take care of yourself and you become vengeful and, and, and cruel. And you, you, take, you take it out on people around you and you're not a positive force. None of that's good. So you suffer more and so does everyone around you. And there's a malevolence that enters into it. None of that's good. So that's what happens if you don't treat yourself like you matter. The first thing I would say is, well, you should be afraid of taking risks and pursuing something meaningful. One of the main reasons that people don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is. And the probability that you're going to get what would be good for you, let's say, which would even be better than what you want, right? Because, you know, you might be wrong about what you want easily, but maybe you could get what would really be good for you. Well, why don't you? Well, because you don't try. Life is a challenge that, in some sense, can't be surmounted. So there's no way out of your problem. But there are certainly proper ways of dealing with it. Yeah. Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, uh, what's, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? I would say that the goal in life is to conduct yourself so that life improves. You should be more afraid of staying where you are if it's making you miserable. Clock is ticking. Yeah, and if you're miserable in your job now and you change nothing, in five years you'll be much more miserable and you'll be a lot older. People don't get what they want and they need because they don't aim at it. And it's a hard lesson for people to learn because they're cynical to begin with and they presume that there's no possible way of moving forward. But it's not so unreasonable to assume that you're not going to hit what you don't aim at, or you're not going to hit what you aim at and don't shoot at. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge, and the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure, you want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world, and you take the slings and arrows of fate and you make yourself stronger while you're doing so and you might fail and fortune might do you in but it's your best bet a huge part of the reason that people fail is because they don't ever set up the criteria for success and so since success is a very narrow line and very unlikely the probability that you're going to stumble on it randomly is zero so you want to set yourself a task that's difficult, but not so difficult you can't attain it. And then what happens is that you step up improvement across time, incrementally. And there's also a certain element of humility to it, right? Which is, don't bite off more than you can chew, right? Don't set grandiose goals, but incremental improvement will get you a tremendous distance.
It's a luxury to pursue what makes you happy. It's a moral obligation to pursue what you find meaningful. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It might require sacrifice. If you need to change your job too, let's say you have a family and, 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 and children and, and a mortgage, you have responsibilities. You've already picked up those responsibilities. You don't just get to walk away scot-free and say, well, I don't like my job, I quit. That's no strategy. But what you might have to do is you think, well, this job is killing my soul. All right, so what do I have to do about that? Well, I have to look for another job. Well, no one wants to hire me. It's like, okay, maybe you need to educate yourself more. Maybe you need to update your, your curriculum vitae, your resume. Maybe you need to overcome your fear of being interviewed. I think what you have to do, and, and this is part of humility, is you have to look around you within your sphere of influence, like the direct sphere of influence, and fix the things that announce themselves as in need of repair. And those are often small things, you know, and, and they can be like your room, put it in order. Because the thing is, it isn't exactly so important that your room is in order, although it is. What's important is that you learn how to distinguish between chaos and order, and to be able to act in a manner that produces order. Three years from now, you can have what you need. You gotta be careful about it. You can't have everything. You can have what would be good for you, but you have to figure out what it is, and then you have to aim at it. And when you're in the zone, you're expanding your skills at, in a manner that's intrinsically rewarding because you're succeeding, and so you wanna set if you're good to yourself, you think, okay, I need to set a goal, but I need to set a goal that someone as stupid and useless as me could probably attain if they put some effort into it. Now, if there are things about your life that are bothering you, or things about the world that are bothering you, then you want to decompose them into solvable sub-problems. You can do something as simple as just sit on your bed and think, okay, there's probably like five things I could do today so that Tomorrow morning is slightly better than this morning was, at least, or at least I'm not falling behind. And those will usually be, it's like having to eat a toad in the morning, right? It's like, it's not gonna be something you wanna do. There'll be things you're trying to avoid. They're snakes, essentially. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. I've dealt with hundreds of people in my clinical and consulting practice, and we set a goal, we develop a vision, and work towards it, and it, it things, inevitably get better for people. So it's not a luxury, it's, it's difficult. It's a moral responsibility and it isn't happiness. It's, it's not, the pursuit isn't for happiness. Well, greatness is what reveals itself when you, when you attempt to formulate, when you attempt to carefully articulate and live out what you believe to be true. It just happens because there isn't anything more powerful than truth, right? That's the antidote to suffering, truth. If you ask yourself, instead of telling yourself, you know, what is it that I could do to set things more right today that I would actually do? It's usually some small thing because you're not that disciplined, you know? Then you can go do it. Lay a disciplinary structure on yourself get the chaos in, in, in check, and then you can move towards a state that's freer. Well, what happens if you don't treat other people like they matter? Well, you lie to them, you cheat them, you steal, you, you, you enter into impulsive relationships with them, they can't trust you, that doesn't go anywhere, they don't like you, you, you end up alone at best and maybe like in, in, incarcerated at worst, like that doesn't work, and so, you watch the people around you who thrive, regardless of what they say, they act out the proposition that everyone matters. If you're hungry and you eat, well, that's good, but it's over and then you're on to the next thing, right? It, it's not exactly sustaining, it's just necessary. That's called consumatory reward, by the way. This other reward system is incentive reward. And the incentive reward system works on dopamine, this neurochemical dopamine, which is also the, the neurochemical tracks that opiates and cocaine and amphetamines, the drugs that people really like to abuse, alcohol often for some people, um, activate. And so you might say if you don't have enough meaning in your life, then you're more prone to addiction.
And that's definitely the case, even with rats. If you take a rat and you put him in a cage by himself and he has nothing to do, and then you give him access to cocaine, he'll get addicted to the point where he won't do anything but take cocaine. But if you throw the rat back in with a bunch of other rats and he gets to do rat things, then it's very hard to get him addicted to cocaine. And so the purposeless rat is prone to addiction. Well, it's the same with human beings. Kind of have this idea that that you have a certain delightful, wonderful, positive freedom as a child, and then that's given up as you approach adulthood. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a lot of potential as a child, but none of that is capable of manifesting itself as freedom before you become disciplined. And discipline is a matter of the imposition of order, and the order is necessary, especially for people who are hopeless and nihilistic. And lots of people are hopeless and nihilistic, way more people than you think. And part of that is because no one's ever really encouraged them. The magnitude of the reward you experience as you're moving towards a goal is proportionate to the importance of the goal. So that means the more important the goal you pick, the more possibility there is for the kind of reward, let's say, it's really a state of being that is life affirming. And it is directly life affirming in that, you know, like if you're in a football game and you're and it's an important football game and maybe you break a finger and, you know, normally that's that's a problem. It hurts and you're going to stop doing whatever you're doing. But if you're right in the middle of the game, then you'll be so amped up on this reward system that it's analgesic. It stops the pain. It also suppresses anxiety. People have, had, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people, you know. You're doing fine in life and then you get cancer. And then six months later you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend and you develop by contending and you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man, that's something to do. I'd rather you hate me and get better than like me and stay the same. What do you stand for? What do you believe in? A lot of us are full of I was one of those people back in the day. And sometimes I'm still full of shit. We think that we're working our ass off, working hard. You know, we've been working out hard in the gym for a month. But we haven't seen any results. So we get off down and poopy pants. You study for 30 minutes for a test. And you didn't do as well as you thought. What do you expect? You're not putting in the work. You have to do more. Everybody goes, what is your secret, man? What's your secret about business? What's your secret about this? What's your secret about that? You don't want the answer. The yeah. answer is, you see these hands? Hard work. The hard work, man. You have to look at suffering as almost like I look at failure. To succeed, you must fail. Learn from yourself, learn from life, learn from your failures, learn from your insecurities, learn from your self-doubt. The truth of the starting line. We live in a world that's very unauthentic. So who are you? What do you stand for? What do you believe in? There's a lot of successful people in this world who still feel empty inside. And they wonder why they still feel empty. So they try to make another million, two million, three million. Let's buy a new car, a new house, a new boat. Let's buy more of everything. At the end of the day, it still feels real empty inside. For me, I wasn't even f***ing successful. I just felt empty. So I was trying to hide my insecurities, my doubts, all this bullshit. So I was trying to dress up a turd. And when you try to dress up a turd, you're still a turd. It's like a turkey. You get a turkey for Thanksgiving. If you don't know what you're doing, you cook that mother without going inside and cleaning it out. You gotta clean the insides out before you start dressing it up. Same thing with life. If you don't get inside your soul, inside your heart, and fix it, be willing to go to war with yourself. It's not magic, it's literally 
you're gonna have to wake up yeah and you're gonna have to sit there and say F today's gonna suck and then when that day is over you're gonna wake up again and say F yeah the next day is gonna suck you're not putting in the work you have to do more and the only way to see who the baddest mother is is to suffer you know a lot of people don't like what i say a lot of people hate that i cuss a lot of people hate a lot of things about me i don't give a when you find out who you are, that's when you start living your life. Don't fit in just for the sake of fitting in in life. Make sure that you have something to say, say it. Within the suffering, go in there, and I call it the live autopsy. The live autopsy, how you find out someone died, they crack you open after you're dead. How you can live is do it while you're alive. And the only message I want to get across to people is, once you change one thing, your mindset, you can attack everything. Mm. Go back in your brain, crack it open while you're alive. Don't wait until you're dead to figure out why you died. Do it while you are living. Go in there, go into the suffering, go into the pain of your life and say, why did this suck for me so bad? Why am I afraid of all this stuff? It's in these nooks of the suffering within your brain, in the scarring, are all the answers to why you are on the couch feeling sorry for yourself. You gotta stop telling yourself that you're doing enough. In life, it's never enough until you feel this overwhelming feeling of, man, I'm out working the crowd. I'm out working everybody. I'm doing more. It's not until then, once you get there, that's when you can know you've done enough. In failure and in suffering, all the answers are in there. All the answers to all the test questions, the test is your life. All the answers are in there. You don't have to live in suffering and pain and failure all the time. You have to learn, I need to visit it. Like people hate working out. You're only gonna visit working out maybe an hour a day. 23 other hours of the day, you're not in it. Mm. But how you become in shape is you must visit suffering, visit working out, one hour a day. All I wanted people to do in my life, I don't care about the money, I don't care about the fame, I don't care if, any, I don't care if all my followers go away tomorrow. I wanted a lot of people that doubted me to look like Apollo Creed did in that 14th round because I got back up repeatedly. And when you keep on getting back up like that, no matter how strong the person is that's beating the out of you, they eventually look at you and say, you know what, I'm tired. And I just want people to be tired. It's funny. I walk around, people come up to me and they say, man, you're that Navy SEAL, you went to Ranger School, you were, you know, Air Force Tac P. The funny thing about it, that I think about is this. They know that part of me. This is the part I know about myself. I felt the ASVAB test to get in the military three times. In the Air Force, I felt that pararescue. In the SEALs, it took me three times to get through Navy SEAL training. This is what I know about me. So what I'm saying is this. You can't live your life being afraid to fail. All those failures made me the success in the day. Most people who are failing are trying their ass off. I don't want to set out and say, oh, there's an A. We're good. It's stupid. No, I want to turn it in a million times and say, you failed. You failed. And I'll say, okay, Roger that. Mm -hmm. And sit there and analyze what I'm doing wrong. Never forget to train your mind. Make sure in life you do what you have to do, say what you have to say, and live the life that you have to live. Don't walk around being a fake human being. Don't be scared to be who you are. Look at your audience uh -huh. who's criticizing you, uh -huh. first of all. Yep. They're not even in your world. Yes. You Don't even talk to me. Yep. Block them out. Go to these places that people don't go to anymore because all this social media and everything's computerized. Mm -hmm. I want to go to that dark place in my mind and say, okay, how are we going to get this done?
When I was 297 pounds and I was fat as hell trying to be a Navy SEAL, the scariest thing in the world to me, even to this day, was that that could have been the rest of my life. I thought then I was trying hard. And sometimes life is fucking hard. So when I first joined the Navy, I had to join the reserves because I couldn't get into active duty because I was so fat. So being a reservist, I got titled a lot of times as a weekend warrior. In the reserves, you work one weekend a month, two weeks a year. A lot of us live our lives that way. We can't work out without purpose. The biggest purpose in life isn't all that sh It's how you respect yourself, how you look at yourself. That's an everyday journey. You're not working your butt off hard enough. You're not trying hard enough. We all think we're trying hard, but what are you gauging that off of? In life, a lot of us work our ass off, trying to get to a, a better place, a place that makes us feel better about ourselves. But guess what happens? Once you get to the actual event, your mind isn't ready. Your mind's not prepared. You've been studying, you've been training, you've been working out, but your mind's not prepared. Story for you, when I was 19 years old, I was going through the Air Force trying to be a pararescueman. I was doing push-ups, sit-ups, swimming, I was doing all the knocking out of the park. One of the best in the class, but the second the obstacle got in my fucking way, I wasn't prepared for it mentally. So every day you should be getting after it. We look at determination, self-discipline, we look at hard work. All these terms is almost like we dread them, almost like a fucking punishment. Those are the biggest words of all time as far as respecting yourself. Trying hard is something in your mind just doesn't stop. Only those people who have been there a million times in their minds and have suffered a million times and realize my legs may break, my knee may break and accept that I know right now, whether you hate me, love me, I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a that, whatever you want to think, I made it. The Washington Bullets select Tyrone Bogues. Oh, now they got the caller from the shortest. Tyrone Bogues, he is now the shortest player in the NBA. Tyrone Bogues from Wake Forest. At the age of five, you know, I got shot. Growing up in the city of Baltimore was challenging. You know, as a kid, you know, it was a lot of drug infested areas in our neighborhood, uh, a lot of shooting, a lot of violence. Unfortunately for me, at the age of five, you know, I got shot. You know, being outside, being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, my mom and dad was going crazy, not knowing that I was outside. And then knowing that, you know, I was one of the kids laying out there with a couple buckshots all over his body was very frightening and scary for them as well as myself. Um, but it was, uh, it was our life, you know, it was a man of growing up. I mean, no one felt like they, no one thought they have a life expectancy past 20, you know, and which was very strange, you know, knowing that that was the case, but that was the mindset back then because we had a lot of guys at a young age dying, uh, mainly because you know, they wanted that fast money. They wanted to get into that world a lot sooner. And uh, they wanted to, you know, possibly take care of their family as well as to try to provide for their, you know, for their household. So, you know, people did all sorts of things in terms of trying to make ends meet. Well, luckily that we had a game called basketball and sports. You know, sports was really uh, a mechanism that kept us really at a safe, it kept us, uh, where it gave us a safe haven place to really feel comfortable at. That was a way of keeping us, you know, off the streets, keeping our mind, you know, active in other areas as opposed to thinking about, you know, hey, it's time to try to you know, go over and get a few of those quick dollars. You know, at that time, I had no inkling or no idea that, you know, I wanted to pursue this as a career. You know, it was just a hobby. It was just something that I wanted to do. Um, but unfortunately for me, you know, being small and uh, trying to play a sport that didn't know at the time was supposed to have been meant for a big or taller player, you know, got a lot of criticism from it, you know, a lot of uh, backlash, a lot of name calling, you know, which could affect which confidence. 
Well, at the beginning, you know, it was challenging. It was tough, you know. Many days, many nights going home, just crying to my mom and just telling her how cruel the kids are out there and, you know, how mean they were. I wanted it all. You know, it wasn't just going to satisfy, satisfy with what someone else had planned for me. You know, I, I wanted to create my own destiny and I started to understand that I was in position to do that. And, you know, when I became 12 and 13 years old, you know, words never matter. You know, it came in one day out the other. You know, I was on a journey, I was on my path, trying to become this basketball player that no one felt like he had any, you know, any opportunity to do some little jokes that step was out there, you know. Uh, if you're short, you know, you need to be sitting on the curb with your feet swinging off. Uh, you know, we could put you in the drawer when we're traveling, you know. As they said, growing up as a kid, when they say sticks and stones may hurt your bones, but words, words would never hurt you. It's not true. Words will hurt you now and they're killing folks. So words are very powerful. And, it, you know, that was very deterring at the time, but it didn't distract me. Because your heart, you know, it measures. It pretty much doesn't have a height to it. You know, it pretty much set the tone of who you are and what you're able to accomplish. You know, and the height factor was the game of basketball. So, you know, my heart was bigger than my height. So I didn't have no, no second or no, no hangups on I'm believing that I belong with, you know, the best of the best, you know, because my heart was just as, you know, just as big as theirs. Things that happened, happened to me in my life allowed me to reflect, allowed me to, to resonate who I am, you know, especially when I got shot. You know, those things became so clear in terms of, hey, I almost wasn't here, you know, so why I have to worry about what someone else said that could hurt me and deteriorate me from becoming who I want to be. So, you know, that changed my mindset. You know, I remember early on when I used to go down on the court with my basketball and hearing all the words and hearing all the, you know, the criticism about me being short. Um, but after I got shot, I remember going back down there and hearing those same criticism about myself, but it didn't have the same impact. You know, it went in one ear out of the other, as I alluded to earlier. Everybody has some sort of opinion about who you are. Don't give them that platform, don't give them the ammunition. That's their opinion. Don't mean that it's true about who you are. So, you know, anything is possible. Um, positive thinking is also translates to that. Everything happened for a reason. No regrets, all the negative things that happened. I'm thankful for it because I learned, hopefully I learned from those situations. And all the positive things. I'm humbly grateful that those were able to take place and still striving to be the best I can be. And, you know, going forward, hopefully I can encourage some kids to be the best they can be. We all human beings. Treat one as you would want to be treated. You may be watching this right now, and you have these incredible ideas, and what you think is missing is motivation. At some point, Everything's going to go south on you. Everything's going to go south, and you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Now, you can either accept that, or you can get to work. That's all it is. You just begin. You do the math. You solve one problem, then you solve the next one. 400 trillion to one. I just want everybody to hear this. This is the reason I'm happy 24-7, 365 for the rest of my life. 400 trillion to one. The odds of becoming a human being. If you want to be a grocer or a general or a politician or a judge, you will invariably become it. That is your punishment. You can decide that you're going to stand up to life. You can decide that I'm going to live each day as if it were my last. They've crunched the numbers on you being born. And do you realize that the odds, the odds of you at the moment in time he was born to the parents you were born to with the DNA structure that you have, one in 400 trillion. If you never know what you want to be. If you live what some might call the dynamic life, but I will call the artistic life, if each day you are unsure of who you are and what you know, you will never become anything, and that is your reward. 
If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. One and four hundred trillion. All day long you have ideas that could change your life, that could change the world, that could change the way that you feel. And what do you do with them? Things we've worked the hardest for, we value the most. So I think, you know, the purpose of a goal is not getting it anyway. The purpose of a goal, you know, is what, who you become. Who you become is going to make you happier, it's going to make you sad. So um, I, I'm not looking for an effortless approach. It's too late to be scared. Not had an encouraging bloody word, a real encouraging word in their entire life. It just takes a little bit of, of encouragement and care so that they're willing to set themselves straight to some degree and start trying. It's just a catastrophe that that's, that's so rare in their lives. That if you're doing something that you're not totally committed to, if you're doing something that you're not totally passionate about, you're compromising yourself every day. Some people want to do ultra races. They're starting to PR during training. Some people want to be a lawyer or a medical student. So they're taking these practice tests. But guess what happens? Once you get to the actual event, your mind isn't ready. Your mind's not prepared. You've been studying, you've been training, you've been working out, but your mind's not prepared. Transforming the walls into doors. Changing obstacles into opportunities. Well, by the time that they closed the second restaurant, it was an $800,000 loss. Ooh. I don't, I, I mean, that meant our entire home equity line gone. Right. It meant um, kids call, I get just choked up just thinking about how terrifying it was and so I found myself at the age of 41 like just feeling like a complete failure because the way that our minds are wired and the fact about human beings is that we are not designed to do things that are uncomfortable or scary or difficult our brains are designed to protect us from those things because our brains are trying to keep us alive. And in order to change, in order to build a business, in order to be the best parent, the best spouse, to do all those things that you know you want to do with your life, with your work, with your dreams, you're going to have to do things that are difficult, uncertain, or scary, which sets up this problem for all of us. You're never going to feel like it. Motivation's garbage. You, you only feel motivated to do the things that are easy, right? And at some point, I think we all hit that moment in life where things just are not going how you thought they would go. And, and what's amazing about those moments is we all respond very differently. I believe desire and will to win is everything. I don't know why I'm like I am, but my butt's always burning. There's always something say, Art Dad Gummit, you're supposed to go for it. Art Dad Gummit, you're supposed to be somebody. You're supposed to make a difference with your life. What does the $500,000 a year person do? The $50,000 a year person doesn't do. You look at the outside and study those two individuals, everything seems to be the same. They both are the same sex, they both are the same age, they have the same training, the same positions, the same contract, the same fringe benefits. They both are successful, they work hard, they're good family people, make tough commitments. But what's the difference? What does the $500,000 a year person do? The $50,000 a year person doesn't do. He pays the price and a little bit more. 
He works hard and a little bit more. He's loyal to the company a little bit more. He believes in a little bit more. He makes money in a little bit more. He saves money in a little bit more. If you want to win in these United States, you got to be tough and you can't quit. I wore one branch manager down to the point that he says to me, Gardner, based on persistence alone, we're going to give you a shot. Because at some point, we all bought into this lie that you got to feel ready in order to change. You know what? You said I couldn't do it, but guess what? I start in two weeks. We bought into this, this complete falsehood that at some point, you're going to have the courage. At some point, you're going to have the confidence, and it's total bullshit. Maybe watching this right now, and you have these incredible ideas, and what you think is missing is motivation. Failure is part of life. The difference for me, though, is I look at failure as a stepping stone to success. It's a, it's a speed bump. Every time you learn something, you learn because something you did didn't work. And that exposes you to the part of the world that you don't understand. Every time you're exposed to a part of the world that you don't understand, you have the possibility of rebuilding the structures that you use to interpret the world. Uh, I know I'm going to fail, uh, but it's not failure if you learn something. And so every time I do, it just becomes it becomes a way for me to explain to someone else what it takes. That's often why it's more important to notice that you're wrong than it is to prove that you're right. People don't value what they don't fight for. Baby steps count too, as long as you're going forward. And one day you add all those baby steps up and you might be surprised at where you can get to. People have an unbelievable capacity to face and overcome things they don't understand. And not only that, that's essentially what gives life its meaning. The Buddhists say, life is suffering. And you think, well, if that's the case, why bother with it? Well, now that we can see how short life really can be, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? That's a trigger. Huh? That's the biggest trigger that I have ever experienced. What are you going to do the rest of your the life? The cavalry ain't coming. You got to do this yourself. Ain't no backup. Okay? Our minds are designed to stop you at all costs from doing anything that might hurt you. Mm -hmm. And the way that, 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 that this all happens is it all starts with something super subtle that none of us ever catch. And that is with this habit that all of us have that nobody's talking about. We all have a habit of hesitating. Mm -hmm. We have an idea, you're sitting in a meeting, you have this incredible idea, and instead of just, you know, saying it, you stop and you hesitate. Now what none of us realize is that when you hesitate, just that moment, that micro moment, that small hesitation, it sends a stress signal to your brain. It wakes your brain up and your brain all of a sudden goes, oh, oh wait a minute, why, wait, why is he hesitating? He didn't hesitate when he put on his killer spiky sneakers. <laughs> he didn't hesitate with the uh, really cool track pants. He didn't hesitate with the NASA t-shirt. Now he's hesitating to talk, something must be up. So then your brain goes to work to protect you. It has a million different ways to protect you. One of them is called the spotlight effect. It's a known phenomenon where your brain magnifies risk. Why? To pull you away from something that it perceives to be a problem. And so you can truly trace every single problem or complaint in your life to silence and hesitation. Those are decisions. And what I do and what's changed my life is waking up and realizing that motivation's garbage. I'm never gonna feel like doing the things that are tough or difficult or uncertain or scary or new. So I need to stop waiting until I feel like it. And number two, I am one decision away from a totally different marriage, a totally different life, a totally different job, a totally different income, a totally different uh, relationship with my kids. Your life comes down to your decisions. And if you change your decisions, you will change everything. What makes life powerful and meaningful and substantive is the expiration date.
You do what you love doing and you do it well, then, then everything should sort of fall into place. If we were to live forever, we could be slowful and lazy and indifferent because we'd have forever to get it straight. But the fact that the clock is ticking puts a sense of urgency on each and every one of us. And I know you're saying, well, I'm 20. I don't need to hear. Yeah, you do. You need to hear that because you won't be 20 long. So many of us choose our path out of fear disguised as practicality. What we really want seems impossibly out of reach and ridiculous to expect, so we never dare to ask the universe for it. I'm saying I'm the proof that you can ask the universe for it. In a few months, you'll be 21 and two and three and four and five, and it's ticking on everybody. Procrastination then becomes an enemy because we cannot afford to procrastinate with a time that we do not have. Most of us right now are looking at where we are with a certain degree of disdain, expecting to have gone further than where we are by now. We look back and wonder, was I really a good steward of the time that God gave me? Imagine, if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the ghost of the ideas, the dreams, the abilities, the talents given to you by life and that you, for whatever reason, you never acted on those ideas, you never pursued that dream, you never used those talents, we never saw your leadership, you never used your voice, you never wrote that book, and there they are standing around your bed looking at you with large angry eyes saying, we came to you and only you could have given us life. Now, must die with you forever. Did I really maximize my life? And the question is, if you died today, what ideas, what dreams, what abilities, what talents, what gifts will die with you? The truth of the matter is, no matter how productive you are, all of us have been guilty of wasting days and wasting time and sometimes wasting opportunities along the way. In fact, what makes you start to get wiser as you get older is that as the sands begin to fall more rapidly and you begin to recognize that you're running out of time, you begin to mark certain things off of your list. I'm not going to let that worry me. I'm not going to let that worry me. This was not important. I'm not going to do that stupid thing again. I don't have time to make that mistake. I've got to redeem the time. i got to make it count. I cannot mess this up. My time becomes more valuable the more it becomes limited. My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. Death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you. But someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. What makes life powerful and meaningful and substantive is the expiration date.
might happen, might not happen. Fifty years I spent like that. Finding myself awake at three in the morning. Do you know what? Ever since my diagnosis, I sleep just fine. My history did not have to become my future. For whatever reason, uh, most people, their associations are to avoid anything that's uncomfortable. But it's so illogical because when you look at comfort and you look at success and progress and the eventual, the feelings of accomplishment and of getting past certain hurdles and in, in terms of like how you feel about life a lot of those are connected to discomfort like discomfort is your friend I was one who swam against the tide of what is expected and what is uh, what the establishment wants from us I began to see the possibilities of not being where I was I came to realize it's that fear that's the worst of it. That's the real. I will stand. I will put both of my feet in the ground. And I will stand for something because if I don't stand for something, I'll fall for anything. If you live your life just acting constantly on the momentum of other people's expectations, of oh. you wanting to be liked by these other people. So, get up. Get out in the real world. Are you here? We heal as a team. We're gonna come inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. You are going to incur incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you will realize is that you have greatness within you. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. What you will realize is that you are greater than your circumstances, that you don't have to go through life being a victim. I was born in Miami, Florida, in an area called Liberty City in an abandoned building on a hard nanolian floor. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. I mean, if you want this, if you want bling bling, if you want to buy the jets, if you want to do work, that's how you get it. How do you get money to do what you love? You don't, right? I lost a load of money when I started doing what I loved. What you do is you position yourself to succeed. So for example, if you're doing something else and you, and you want to do this thing you love, you do it after hours. You work nine to six, you get home, you kiss the dog, and you go to town, right? I mean, you start building your equity and your brand and whatever you're trying to accomplish after hours. You, everybody has time. Stop watching Lost. The reason people aren't patient is they value other people's opinions too much. You need to bet on your strengths and don't give a f about what you suck at. You're gonna, uh, way too many people in this room are gonna spend the next 30, 40 years of their lives trying to check the boxes of the things that they're not as good at and that you're gonna waste a f load of time and lose. I highly recommend auditing yourself or if you have no empathy or EQ or self-awareness, then find somebody in your family or friendship that does and let them tell you who you are. And once you believe that, either for yourself or someone else told you, go directly all chips all into that because that is the only possible way, in my opinion, watching from the outside, that is, let me rephrase, that is a very highly likely way of over-indexing because the truth is, if you want to be an anomaly, you've got to act like one. I think there's massive confusion around entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship sucks. I mean, it's lonely. It's high risk. I mean, I can't live without it, but it's like a bad boyfriend, right? Or girlfriend, right? Like, like it's, there's a ton of bad days being an entrepreneur. Not to mention 98% of entrepreneurial ventures are gonna fail. So there's gonna be a really bad day in your future. Ability to adjust is the entire game. Like, I'm so proud that I ch 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 
changed my mind every day. My dad used to get so pissed when I was building Wine Library. He would always be like, he's like, he would say like, three months ago you said Ricky was gonna be the best employee. I'm like, I changed my mind. He should fire him. Or, or he's like, you said sparkling wine was important. Now you just eliminated it from the key spot. I'm like, I changed my mind. Like, my ability to only be comfortable in massive chaos has been my biggest asset as an entrepreneur. Like, I would never take a note. Like that scares the piss out of me what these three people are doing right now. There should be some sort of friction from somebody who's leading up in front and sees everything and is driving a company versus people that work in it who are in the, like they're different. Like my job is to be like, oh sh- there's an iceberg. I'm gonna move this way. And everybody who's downstairs is like, what do you mean? The water's been super clear the whole time. I'm like, no, no, there's an iceberg. But they're in the basement. They're like, it's been such a nice ride. Like this has been so smooth. Leaders need to understand what's happening next. There are a million reasons why not, but there's one great reason why, which is you've just gotta persevere, no matter what it is. It's just the way it is. It's hard being an entrepreneur. It's hard building a business. Everybody thinks it's so easy. What really pissed me off in tech world was when Steve Jobs' book came out when he was dying, when it was all about Steve three or four years ago. I literally watched a lot of my tech startup friends start being like a to their staff. Because Jobs was tough, everybody fell into the romance of like, I have this big vision and I'm gonna be a like Steve, right? And I thought that was really interesting for me to watch that half decade of like literally watching people I know and then watching them act differently because the status or the icon of the moment and you see a lot of that. And so like that is probably the energy I'm trying to bring to this class today which is you can look at like how people roll and like it's great to admire and things of that nature but it's so damn important to stick to like your DNA, right? And like what you're good at. In a success world, please understand that success is happiness not net dollars in. We are strong as We're really strong. We're just being sold that we're not because there's a lot of money. People always say they're gonna do shit. The biggest epidemic in the world is people talking, not doing. And especially now, and people always do that. But now what social media does is expose people. It doesn't change people. All the hate in the system, that's exposing. Twitter didn't make you evil, you're evil. You know, and same with talking and not doing. Twitter, Instagram didn't make you waste time and not do. In 2001, it snowed in New Jersey uh, on December 23rd, which was one of the busiest days of the year. Typically, December 23rd is the busiest day of the year in a liquor store. Um, And a woman called us, we just started shipping, and her case of Behringer White Zinfandel wasn't delivered. First of all, I appreciate the people that know what Behringer White Zin is, good job. The entire case, by the way, 15 pack, the entire 15 pack case cost $45. We're doing about $40,000 an hour in the store. She calls. I find out about it, somehow it was buzzing because I was on the floor selling. I am the premier salesman on the floor, as you can imagine. I find out about it and we're debating what to do. She needs it for her Christmas dinner. I grab the case, throw it in my car and drive to Bergen County to deliver it. It takes me two and a half hours to complete the whole thing. And the best part was, I delivered it, all pumped with myself and she said, great, and closed the door. Awesome. Everybody, especially my dad, who was that I left because all the customers that came in asking for me or that I could have sold, everybody was baffled. I can't tell you what the ROI of driving through the snow in my car to deliver a case of $45 pink to a woman that looked like Yoda was. But I can tell you this, over the next two to three years, that story became the foundation of how we treated every single customer. It became our competitive edge. And those are the things that matter to me.
you need to do you. Like, some, plenty of people that make a f- load more money than me and one bigger take f- notes. The key, the key though, the key is way too many people are doing, like, here's a good one. You know what really pissed me the f- off? I'm completely driven by like happiness and like I'm crippled by like chaos. Like I, I think I've fired the four most talented, smartest people that have worked for me because if you don't know how to play with the other boys and girls, you're out because I suffocate under, you know, conflict and negativity and like nobody's better than me so you, you gotta go. Building a business is hard and you know what makes it really hard? Everything that happens every day of every moment. So. You can pick time, you can pick money as the one or two things that you think stop you from winning your game, but the truth is there's a million reasons. 99% of businesses go out of business for a reason and that reason is it's hard. And so, if you're watching this show, I've got a sense of who you are and you need to start creating layers and layers and layers and layers of skin to be able to get through I'm a humongous believer that ideas are shit and that execution's the game, right? We've all got ideas. Everybody's got ideas. Do you have any ideas we all have here? We could probably sit here for the next two hours, draw them all out, record them, and predict the next 78 great startups over the next nine years. And? So I think the thing that is another theme in entrepreneurship is there is way too much fodder brought to the idea Uber was Magic Cab three years earlier. Uber is not an idea. Uber existed. It's called Magic Cab. But the guys that executed it sucked. So they lost. So I think, you know, if there's any level of romance left in this room about your idea, I'd like to suffocate it. Because I think the actual situation is what you actually do with it. If you do anything because of this keynote, there's only one thing I ask you to do. Because as zenny as I got, I'm a practical Here's what I want from you. When you go home, look yourself in the mirror and audit everything you and your business do. I promise you that if you audit from top to bottom of expenses and effort and time and energy and payroll and all that, if you audit all of it, even the best of us, even the InBevs, which is the company that bought Budweiser, they built their whole business on like printing on both sides of the paper and all that work. Even the most efficient ones of us are doing 20% dumb shit. If you take that 8%, that 13%, that 16% of dumb shit that you're doing, paying that person that's not bringing any cultural value to your business, having that contract that you've just been in and you just renewed because you're busy as f- whatever the f- you're doing, if you take any piece of that percentage and you apply it to giving a f- about your customer, it will be better for your business going forward because for the first time since we all lived in small towns where your reputation was the complete backbone of how you did business, for the first time because technology is bringing us back together in a small town, for the first time being good and caring and following up matters. You gotta create that new norm. That has to be your lifestyle. You are the master of your own mind. Create that masterpiece. Be proud of yourself at the very end of it all. We've kind of lost touch with the cultural narratives around death that gave it some meaning. So now when it happens, it's just this absurd, scary thing that we don't know what to do with. The only narrative we have that we have absorbed, I guess, is that of the, um, the brave battle that someone's fighting. If you're going to try, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. That this is, this is when we can bring our, if we have the opportunity to bring our stories to some kind of ending, watch you know, a film or read a book, that final scene makes sense of everything that's happened before. This doesn't happen in life. Author of our stories more than at any point before death. If you're going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe your mind. Main characters are our loved ones, or the doctors, or people making all these decisions, and we kind of get sidelined. Go all the way. It could mean not eating for three or four days. 
It could mean freezing on a park bench. It could mean jail. It could mean derision, mockery, isolation. Isolation is the gift. It's not okay for you to be weak loser. It's not okay. And the reason it's not okay is because you could be way more than that. And it's a crime, an ethical crime, for you to allow all that necessary potential to go to waste. It hurts you, it hurts your family, it hurts the world. Really, really, it does. All the others are a test of your endurance, of how much you really want to do it. And you'll do it, despite rejection and the worst odds. Now, when I was 15 years old, I had a very important person in my life come to me and say, who's your hero? And I said, I don't know, I gotta think about that. Give me a couple of weeks. I come back two weeks later, this person comes up and says, who's your hero? I said, I thought about it. You know who it is? I said, it's me in 10 years. So I turned 25, 10 years later. That same person comes to me and goes, so are you a hero? And I was like, not even close. No, no, no. She said, why? I said, because my hero's me at 35. So you see, every day, every week, every month, and every year of my life, my hero's always 10 years away. I'm never gonna be my hero. I'm not going to attain that. I know I'm not. And that's just fine with me because that keeps me with somebody to keep on chasing. The only person I could really hold accountable was myself. And the second I stopped blaming people and blaming myself, I changed. It will be better than anything else you can imagine. If you're going to try, go all the way. There is no other feeling like that. You will be alone with the gods, and the nights will flame with fire. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. All the way. All the way. You will ride life straight to perfect laughter. It's the only good fight there is. Tomorrow they said. But tomorrow never came for them. It never came. It's easy to sit on the edge of your bed and to think, there are things I'm doing, there are things I'm not doing, that I should be doing, that I could and would do small things you don't want to get grandiose but you can you can start to improve your life incrementally by eliminating those things that are self-evidently making you bitter and miserable but you have to decide that that's what you want you are willing to burn off that dead wood to sacrifice that bitterness and that unhappiness even though you may feel that you're justified in in, in 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 harboring it you may even be justified in harboring it because people have very hard lives and sometimes they're very badly mistreated but you need to think it's okay if things improve and it would be worthwhile for me to start to abandon those things that I'm doing that I know to be harmful to myself Every single person who has ever done anything worthwhile or exceptional or difficult or extraordinary, anyone, whether it's great artists or authors or mathematicians, everyone encounters difficulties. There is no easy road. It does not exist. It is impossible. Everyone has issues. When you come up with excuses for why other people are successful and you're not,
we all go through hard times. We all go through depression. We all do go through doubt and, and, and moments in your life where it's really f difficult and you're trying to figure out what the f your path is going to be. It's hard. That is what makes you a person. And those difficult moments are what build your character. Show me a great man who's the son of a great man. These kids that are born billionaires, you're never going to be a self-made person. You think that successful people have some lucky charm. Well, let me tell you something. I woke up this morning and I couldn't find my lucky charm. I and other successful people wake up every day doing the same thing, fighting. Fighting back against the distractions, the fears, the doubts. And we learn over time, we build into a habit to spend more time having control instead of more time being out of control. It does matter. It mattered last night when you laid down and you put your head on a pillow. You were going to get up this morning and you were going to make it matter. Everything you did today, we're going to do today, was going to have a purpose behind it. It was going to matter. If I want to be successful, I do it right now. Stop talking about the future and do it now. Tomorrow may never come. Action is in the mind. You don't need everything to be in a perfect position to get started. If you want to open a business, you can do it right now. You can start writing the business plan. You can start the research and working the numbers. Businesses start with an idea. They do not start on opening day. Businesses start with an idea. They do not start on opening day. We get caught up in the Hollywood film version of opening a business, but it isn't reality. You don't arrive on day one and start serving customers in the shop front on Main Street. You start way before that. I speak to so many lost young men with dreams and aspirations of opening companies and businesses, but all of them without fail are waiting for the perfect situation to start. They are waiting for savings to accumulate. They are waiting for the right economy. But it will never be the right time to start, so you might as well get started now. The wind may be blowing the wrong way. It may be raining. It may be an economic crisis. But whatever is going on, you must get going. It does matter. It mattered last night when you laid down and you put your head on a pillow. You were going to get up this morning and you were going to make it matter. Everything you did today, we're going to do today, was going to have a purpose behind it, it was going to matter. This is still an awesome life. There's still a lot of awesome shit to do. And don't think that you don't have opportunity. Consistency will knock the shit out of motivation every time. It's nice to have someone say that you're great or whatever, but like, to be totally honest, it never really matters to me. I'm not great, I just work really hard. I just hang on, I, I don't give up. Something I wanted to mention here is I hear people talking about how they have a hard time with consistency and sometimes they have a hard time with motivation. A good way to handle motivation is to eliminate it as a factor. Sometimes the greatest decision you can make is no decision. Sometimes the easiest thing to do when you struggle with something is to abstain from it. You have a drug addiction, you have a sex addiction, you have a food addiction. Fasting, not allowing yourself to make any choices, eliminates a lot of the confusion and struggle 
and poor decision making skills that you tend to make each and every day with your food because you're fatigued, you're stressed, and so on. The same thing is true with motivation. If we just don't really worry about how motivated we are and we just go and do, then that that kind of settles that. You're already in it. You're already on it. You're already after it. You're already going, right? Now, how do, how do you get someone to do that? That's the tough part. But it ain't that hard because I got advices for you. Here's what I would do. Here's what I would suggest. Things need to have a very strong, you always need a strong foundation. If you have a strong foundation, that's always something you can pivot back off of again. If you don't have something strong, you got something wobbly, uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna really work in the long term. It can work in the short term, which is cool because it can get you momentum towards your goals, but we need stuff that's gonna really work in the long term. And what's gonna work in the long term is to just have a schedule. Try to have a schedule, even if you don't feel like that you're not, let's just say you don't feel like you're an organized person. Let me just share something with you guys about that. I don't feel like I'm an organized person, but I'm a lot more organized today than I've ever been in my life. And some people may identify me as not being very organized, but if you had to do the shit that I did in a day, your motherfucking head would be spinning too. <laughs> And look, I'm not complaining. This is stuff that I choose to do, right? <clears throat> changing your dialogue is really important and changing the message you give yourself. So if you don't feel like you're an organized person, that's okay. It's okay to identify that as a weakness. But that doesn't mean that you can't learn it. And that doesn't mean that we can't get on a schedule. And that doesn't mean that we can't get on point. And that doesn't mean we can't build consistency. Because consistency will knock the shit out of motivation every time. It will knock the shit out of motivation every time. If we can build consistency, we ain't got to worry about how fired up we are to go do something. You can be in a good mood. You can be in a bad mood. You can be in a sad mood. You can be in a shit mood. You can find out the worst thing and you will just shrug it off and be like, this is what I'm doing. That's the way I handle my workouts is I just schedule them we're doing this and like they're not scheduled like weeks out you know for some of you you may want to try to you know have a specific routine I don't really love routine but I do flourish on it I'll admit that and I think that's probably true with everybody everyone probably you know there's a reason why the military works the way that it does and why they're able to produce leaders the way that they are because there's a routine involved and people respond really well to routine. Look at how broken a lot of the people are that go into the military and look how strong they are sometimes when they come out. And we all admire that, right? What did they do that's special? They exercised really hard, right? They got on a schedule and we're all, we're all you know, amazed at the discipline. And like, man, how do they stay so motivated? It's not, there's no motivation. It's a schedule. It's a routine. We're doing this and then we're doing that. I have never experienced military training. I have never experienced what it would be like, but I can only imagine. Everybody kind of knows what their schedule is. If you're having a hard time with consistency with your training, write down when you want to train. The day before. 24 hours ahead of time. So whenever you're done with your last training session, whenever you're done with your last training session, if you if you finish a training session at 4 p.m. and you're like, you know what, I'd really love to train tomorrow morning. I'd love to train at like 6 and see what that feels like. Write it down. None of this may be bullshit. None of this, hey, you know what, if I'm feeling it, I'm going to go and I'm going to go give it hell. None of that shit. That is bullshit. Understand that myself and many other, you know, quote unquote, fitness professionals, fitness, fitness gurus, or whatever you want to call people, understand that we hate it sometimes too, and we don't want to do it sometimes too. 
we love it and I realize look there's other there's way worse things to cry about in this world than going in and doing a hard training session so I'm not trying to be a bitch about it I'm not trying to be a baby about it I'm very grateful for the life that I have and I'm very grateful that we have the freedom in this country where I can go I can go play weightlifter for the day I can go play power lifter for the day I can go you know exercise and pretend to be a bodybuilder or whatever right like what did it what did it make? I mean, that's something that you should all realize, right? Like, you hear people talking a lot about gratitude. Well, I'm very grateful. I have a lot of gratitude towards that fact. Everyone's life is a little different. People have different, uh, people have different amounts of money and different things like that. But this is still an awesome life. There's still a lot of awesome shit to do. And don't think that you don't have opportunity. You have many of the same exact opportunities that I have or anybody else. It always seems like The Rock is on cloud nine, right? It seems like he has so much, right? But what does he have? He probably has great people around him. It seems like he has a great significant other. It seems like he has a great family. It seems like he has a great job. We all have the same exact right towards happiness as The Rock does. We all, we all possess the ability to be just as happy as him. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Are you downloading this shit? Are you on page 43? Because that's the page that you need to be on. Why? Because I've said so. We're on page 43. That's the page that we're on. That's the page we're always on. We're never on any other page. Because we got to be on the same page, class. Guys, write it down. Write shit down. Write shit down. I don't like to write stuff down, but I respond really well to it. How do you make yourself accountable? Find a training partner and text them. Say 4 a.m. That just means see you tomorrow at 4 a.m. You have to be there at 4 a.m. And what happens when you miss? The guy calls you a chump. The guy's like, dude, what's all this 4 a.m. talk? You know, if you want to get on point, you want to get on schedule, then create a schedule, write one down. Why would you miss an 11 a.m. workout if you planned your day around it? Like what, that, what a stupid thing that is, right? But everyone's always looking for their pre-workout to do something great for them. And what about the pre-workout that happens on your own? The food that you ingest, the planning that you do. Think about how empowering this is, you know? I think everyone's always just waiting for somebody to do something for them. I think a lot of people are waiting and I, I'm guilty. This is the only reason why I'm ever able to speak on any of this stuff. So please don't ever think that I'm some pompous asshole. Um, I only know how to speak on things because I am a failure. I am the biggest failure you will ever meet. I have messed up many times. Uh, my mindset has been broken and poor and I've made bad decisions. I've done bad things to, bad, to people. I'm never going to claim to be special. But I am proud. I'm proud of the things that I've worked on. I'm proud of the things that I've worked towards. Think about how pow empowering this is, though, right? I could say something to you, right? All right? We could meet, and I could say, Hey, man, dude, you look like... You look like you can lift a house, you know, and, and maybe that uplifts you and you get excited because you've been training really hard for a long time, right? Sometimes things like that, they last a, a while and sometimes from the right person, and then this happens to me still this day, I get a compliment from somebody I admire. It feels great, you know, it feels great when somebody tells you you look good or it's a good feeling, right? Somebody says, wow, I can't believe you. Looks like you've lost about 20 pounds. You've been losing weight and you're like, yeah, actually I did. I lost about 18 pounds. Things are going really good. I'm feeling really good. Or a friend of mine shared with me more recently, he thought he grew up thinking that he was ugly. <laughs> what a horrible thing to do, right? What a horrible thing to put on yourself. He thought he was ugly. He had like vanity issues. And one day a girl said, hey, me and a bunch of my friends think you look like so-and-so. It was a famous actor. And they said, you're, you, you, we think you're really cute. And he was floored by that. And he was just so excited by that, that helped build momentum really for the rest of his life. What changed though when that person said that? What changed? Nothing changed. 
nothing changed, right? Like everything changed because he made changes because his, his dialogue in his head, his mindset shifted. He couldn't believe that somebody, that somebody said that to him. But isn't that crazy? Like nothing actually changed, nothing physical changed. He didn't do anything different. It's, it's your own inner speaking to yourself, the way that you treat yourself. And I think we are really rude and disgusting to ourselves. We say a lot of mean shit to ourselves. We put ourselves down a lot, which I actually think putting yourself down here and there is actually effective. Telling yourself you're too fat, telling yourself you're too skinny, telling yourself that you want to make you, telling yourself things that you have control over and that you're going to do something about it. I think that's healthy. But I always also say never kick the down opponent. Never kick a downed opponent. Someone's down, you never kick them. Let's say you have somebody that's out of shape. Let's say you have somebody that can only perform, they can only do one push-up. They make a decision one day. And they say, you know what? Look themselves in the mirror. They say, self, you know what? You're out of shape. And you really haven't, let's not feel bad about it. Because if we're being honest about it, you haven't done anything about it. Right? It would be like if I went to go play baseball one day and I struck out a bunch of times and I was really, really frustrated that I struck out. Well, when's the last time I played baseball? How much have I been working on that? I haven't been working on it, so I shouldn't be frustrated about it. If you really haven't been working on trying to be less fatterist, then you shouldn't be sad about being fat. I'm not saying you should be proud about it either, but you shouldn't be sad about it. You should plan a, an attack about it. If a person is out of shape and they make a decision to go to the gym and they can only do one push-up, and then a couple little, you know, a couple days go by, they hit the gym again. Boom, they hit the gym again, they hit the gym again. They're like, man, I had to try those push-ups. I really suck at those push-ups. Now they can do two push-ups. Now they can do three push-ups. Now they can do five push-ups. That'll be the most empowering thing that probably ever happens to some people because you wanna know why? Because some people never get one pat on the back their entire life. It's nice to have someone say that you're great or whatever, but like, to be totally honest, it never really matters to me. I always think it's kind of weird. You're great. Like, what? I'm not. What am I great? For? Like, that's, that's a weird thing to say. I'm not great. I just work really hard. I just hang on. I, I don't give up. And a lot of it has to do with my upbringing. I say this every day. I have two awesome parents. I have an awesome brother. I grew up with two awesome brothers. One died. My oldest brother, he, he died. He, you know, he was addicted to drugs. He was addicted to alcohol. He was addicted to all kinds of crazy stuff. But I think the most dangerous thing that he was addicted to is addicted to all the wrong shit. He couldn't figure out a way to be happy, even though he was famous, even though he uh, was a professional wrestler. He got in the ring with The Undertaker, with Bret Hart. He got in the ring with just about every single top level guy from that era you could think of. He was a Division I football player. He did all kinds of cool stuff, but he couldn't find the thing that eludes so many. He couldn't find that inner peace because he couldn't earn self-respect because he knew he was making mistakes and he felt like he had no control over a lot of them. You're not alone in feeling that way. There's millions of people that feel that way. And I cannot think of one other way that you can fix that without going in the gym and lifting some weights because you're not going to get that in a boardroom you're not going to get that at work you're not going to get that from selling insurance you're not going to get that from selling advertising you're not going to get that from instagram you're not going to get that from facebook you're not going to get that from social media period you're not going to get that from youtube you need in real life hugs and in real life smooches and in real life, hands being put together for you. And for some of you that don't feel like you have got one person in your corner that does shit for you, 
we're almost always all fortunate to have like one person. There's always like one mentor in there. I'm a believer, a believer that everyone ends up with one, even when they have the people that they want to love them, don't love them, they end up in somebody's hands that do love them enough. So you got that one person, so you got that one reason to kind of hang on. Hang on for yourself, hang on for at least that one person. You can make yourself proud, and by making yourself proud, it'll be the most powerful thing that you ever do. You're not trying to compare yourself to other people. You can try to compare yourself to your former self and not comparing yourself to where people are right now. It's This is you versus you. As Elliot Holt says, the war has begun. It certainly has. And it's a war against yourself every single day. Because if we can gain self-respect and we can earn self-respect, self-respect has to be earned. It's not something that's ever gonna be given out. If you go to the gym and when you started on day one, you could only do one push up and now you can do 10, you earn that. And that's not anything that can be outsourced. It can't be handed to you. It can't be purchased. It can't be bought. I mean, dreams are dreams, but goals are different. Goals are things that you, you know are gonna happen, that you know you're capable of. And you wanna know what? There's no reason to be overly concerned or worried about them because they're gonna happen because everything that you need is inside of you already to get you there. You're already there. And some of the things that you accomplished, maybe you're not that proud of some of them, but I bet you there's a bunch of stuff that you are pretty proud of. Lean on your strengths. Everyone's always talking about working on your weaknesses. What about working on your strengths and amplifying those, doubling and tripling down on those? And when you are able to build momentum, you're gonna recognize this. You're gonna recognize and understand that people that are put in places to run things or be in charge of things, are, they're not any smarter than you, they're not any different than you. They're probably dumber than you. The only way to grow is to go through shit that's hard and shit that's difficult. And you're gonna go through hard shit anyway in your day to day. You're gonna go through tough shit in your day, day to day stuff anyway, regardless of what you do or how you do it. There's gonna be good things, there's gonna be bad things. You're gonna go through all kinds of stuff in your life. It's very simple. This is what I believe, and I'm willing to die for it. Yeah. Period. It's that simple. You can't be scared to die for the truth. The truth is the only thing that's ever going to be constant. The only thing that I see that is distinctly different about me is I'm not afraid to die on a treadmill. You might have more talent than me, you might be smarter than me, but if we get on the treadmill together, there's two things. You're getting off first, yeah. or I'm gonna die. It's really that simple. You're not going to outwork me. It's, it's, a, it's a very, it's such a simple, basic, concept the guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball you know he, oh, he got the oh he got the oh okay he got two he, oh god he hustled he grabbed that one that was going to be out of bounds but he saved it uh, back in it's like the commodity that i see the majority of people who aren't getting the places they want or aren't achieving the things that, that they want in this business is strictly based on hustle. It's strictly based on being outworked. It's strictly based on missing crucial opportunities. I say all the time, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Greatness is not this uh, wonderful, esoteric, elusive, 
godlike feature that only the special among us are, will ever taste. You know, it's something that truly exists in all of us. I want to do good. Yeah. I want the world to be better because I was here. I want my life, I want my, my work, uh, my, my family, I want it to mean something. And it's like, it has, if, if you are not making someone else's life better, then you're wasting your time. You know, like the, the, your life will become better by making other lives better. The first step before anybody else in the world believes it is you have to believe it. There's no reason to have a plan B because it distracts from plan A. I realize that when, to, to have the level of success that I, I want to have is difficult to spread it out and do multiple things. It takes such a desperate, obsessive focus. You really got to focus with all of your fiber and all of your heart and all of your creativity. I've, I've never really viewed myself as particularly talented. Where I excel is ridiculous sickening work ethic you know while the other guy's sleeping I'm working while the other guy's eating I'm working the road to success is through commitment and through the strength to drive through that commitment when it gets hard and it is going to get hard and you're going to want to quit sometimes but it'll be colored by who you are and more who you want to be being realistic is the most commonly traveled road to mediocrity. Why would you be realistic? What's the point of being realistic? Yeah, I'm going to do it. It's done. It's already done. The second I decide it's done, it's already done. So right. now we just got to wait for y'all to see. I'm motivated by fear. Fear. You know? Um, fear of what? That fear of fear. I hate being scared to do something. And I think what developed uh, in, my, in my early days was the, the attitude that I started attacking things that I was scared of. I don't want to be uh, an, an icon. Um, I want to be an idea, you know? I want to represent an idea. I want to represent possibilities. I want to represent magic, right? that you're in a universe and two plus two equals four. Two plus two only equals four if you accept that two plus two equals four. Two plus two is gonna be what I want it to be, you know? And there's a, there's a, like there's a, there's a, a redemptive power that making a choice has, you know, rather than feeling like you're at a effect to all the things that are happening make a choice like you just decide what it's going to be who you're going to be how you're going to do it just decide and then from that point the universe is going to get out your way it's like it's water it wants to it wants to move and go around stuff you know so for, for me i want to represent possibilities i want to represent the idea that you really can make what you want you know, if you're going to be here, then there's a necessity to make a difference. I feel very strongly that we are who we choose to be. As a child, my parents always told me, you could be whatever you want to be. You could do whatever you want to do. And, you know, that, that office, that position, the, the highest office on the face of the earth, it was something I heard my parents saying it, but I didn't totally believe it. Yet I went out in the world and I carried myself and I held my head high and I stood there and I looked people in their eyes and I talked to people as if I was deserving of everything that this planet has to offer. This, uh, this one year, my father had his shop and he decided for whatever reason that he wanted a new wall on the front of his shop. So he tore down probably about uh, you know, 
know, 16 feet high and probably about uh, 30 feet long. He just completely tore the wall down. And my brother and I had to dig a six foot hole. We would mix in the concrete by hand. We were building this wall for a year and a half. Every day after school, we would come and mix in concrete, put it in the hole, doing it. And it was just myself and my little brother. And I remember standing back, looking at that wall, saying, there's gonna be a hole here forever. A year and a half later, we laid the, the final brick. And my father stood back and he looked at me and my brother and said, well, don't y'all never tell me that you can't do something. And walked into the shop and I learned very young, you, you don't try to build a wall. You don't set out to build a wall. You don't say, I'm gonna build, build the biggest, baddest, greatest wall that's ever been built. You don't start there. You say, I'm gonna lay this brick as perfectly as a brick can be laid. There will not be one brick on the face of the earth that's gonna be laid better than this brick that I'm gonna lay in this next 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you do that every single day. Oh. Soon you have a wall. Yeah. And I think psychologically, the advantage that that, that gives me over, over a lot of people that I come, have been in competition with in different situations is it's difficult to take the first step when you look how big yeah, exactly. the, the task is. The task is never huge to me. We didn't grow up uh, with the sense that where we were was where we were going to be. You know, we grew up with the sense that where we were almost didn't matter because we were it, becoming we were becoming something greater. The greatest thing in my in my career has been the constant commitment to putting something in the world of value, mm -hmm. not putting something in the world that makes me look hot, mm -hmm. you know? So I think as long as you can stay focused on delivering your art and delivering yourself and delivering your energy and delivering your ideas for the world to be better. Difference between depression and joy, right? And I think it's purpose, right? It's like when you wake up in the morning and your life means something to somebody other than you, that you have a purpose. If you don't go do the things that you're gonna do, people's lives will suffer. And I think that that kind of purpose, that like to live in service, not to you, but to live in service to humanity, to live in service to your family, to live in service to your church, to your city, to your country, to the world. Living in service is that, I, uh, I feel like that is the purest form of joy. The separation of talent and skill is one of the, 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 the greatest misunderstood concepts for people who are trying to excel, who have dreams that want to do things. Talent you have naturally. Skill is only developed by hours and hours and hours of beating on your craft. He who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. And I want you to keep in your heart, just know that you can. You know, somebody once said you can take all the money in the world out of the hands of everybody, out of all the wealthy people in the world who are really successful, give it to other people. It wouldn't take too long. Those people would have it back in their hands. It's not because they're manipulative. It's because they have a standard. The reason people don't put themselves in a position to fail, the reason people aren't patient, is they value other people's opinions too much. You have to monitor your self-talk. Monitor your self-talk. If you go around people, tell people, oh, I have a horrible memory, I'm not smart enough, I'm getting too old, fill in the blank. Take those three magic words and live them. Raise your standard. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. You gotta be willing to do it afraid. See, you might be waiting for the fear to stop. I should leap, leap afraid. You chose to withdraw because you were afraid. You're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility. People are rewarded in public for what they've practiced for years in private. Stay on guard to your mind because your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk. Your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk.
rather die leaping than on the edge figuring out how to get the courage to leap. Okay, I'm gonna go make this happen. I'm gonna go make this much money. I'm gonna transform my kids. I'm gonna create the ultimate relationship in my life. I'm gonna transform my body, whatever it is. And then you don't have strong enough reasons and you don't lose, use it. You don't follow through. It's because you didn't back up your standards with what makes those standards real, and that's rituals. You constantly remind yourself after every defeat, after every setback, every time you get knocked down, I've got a saying, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. See, a lot of people, because of failure, they stop, they stop believing. Let me share something with you. You will fail your way to success. So many times we're waiting. We're waiting, I'm waiting. Eight out of 10 millionaires have been financially bankrupt. You will fail your way to success. It doesn't matter how many times you fail. It doesn't matter how many times people tell you that you can't do it. It doesn't matter if you don't have a dime in the bank. You will fail your way to success. What's the standard they hold themselves to? And then what are all those little rituals that up? Because think about it. Success and failure are not giant events. They don't just show up. You don't just suddenly become successful or suddenly have this cataclysmic event that makes you fail. It may look that way, but failure comes from all the little things. You're just kind of waiting. You're waiting to get everything in order. You're waiting. You're waiting so that everything is, is in you, it's together. You're waiting to not be afraid. You're waiting to have the courage. You're waiting to have all the money. You're waiting. You've got five seconds and that's it. Today. Five seconds gone. Talk yourself out of it. It's failure to make the call. It's failure to check the books. It's failure to say, I'm sorry. All the results in your life are coming from your rituals. Rituals define us. Knowing that you're never going to feel like doing all the work that it takes to have this business be everything that it possibly could. And all those little failures day after day come together until one day some cataclysmic event happens and you blame that. That event happened because you missed all the little and stuff. And when you want to do it right and you want to wait till you're not afraid and you want to wait till you have it all together, oh, you made it about you again. See, Nelson Mandela did it. He just did it not knowing if it were right. Mahatma Gandhi just did it not knowing if it were right. Mother Teresa just did it not looking for affirmation or confirmation. Is this right? Martin Luther King did it not even knowing if it would happen before his life ended. What are you waiting on? Are you willing to do it afraid? Are you willing to do it knowing that you got so much work to do to get it better, to get it more perfect? But are you willing to do it inside your imperfection? Do you realize that in your imperfection, you're perfect for the job? Little bite-sized steps, little things you do each day that after you do them, you get so much momentum that it's easy to succeed. You're not overwhelmed. You have these victory day after day after day on little things. The brain is going to screw you over. The brain is going to go into autopilot. The brain is going to tell you it doesn't feel like doing things. Raise your standard. From the moment that you have the idea, from the second you have that idea, you've only got five seconds to take action. Otherwise, it's gone. There's only one rule when it comes to productivity. There's only one rule when it comes to success. There's only one rule to getting everything you've ever wanted. And here it is. You're never going to feel like it. Ever. In any area of your life that you don't have what you want, whether it's the amount of money, the amount of people on your team, the amount of sales, the amount of trips for your family, the re if you only did the things that you don't feel like doing, you'd have everything you've ever wanted. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. You have these victory day after day after day on little things. If you went to Ultimate Edge, I'm sure you learned about the hour of power or the 15 minutes to be able to be fulfilled or 30 minutes to thrive, where you literally just condition your body and emotion with a couple little rituals. So it doesn't matter what's going on in your world, you feel that strength and it's not fake, it's not some pump up, it's coming from inside you and it works. Rituals define us. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish. You just have to do things that you never think you're going to have to do in order to, to survive and get through it. When you're going through hell, don't stop. Don't pitch a tent in hell. Don't build a holiday inn in hell. 
it, you know, it takes as long as it takes. I hate to say that. You know, if I, you know, you can go to the gym for nine hours, but you won't get into shape. Mm. But if you go to the gym every day for 20 minutes, you will get into shape. But the problem is I don't know how long it takes. Mm. It'll be a little quicker for some, a little slower for others. And so there's no app for trust. There's no app for that. You know, this is a human condition, and we have to do the things that are right for human beings. And you won't build trust with everybody on the team at the same pace. Some will be quicker and some will be slower. How long does it take to make a friend? You know, I don't know. I just know that if you do the right thing, you will make a friend. You gotta get up, you gotta get out. The amount of time you spend outside your proximity or location where you sleep gives you a better chance of being successful. So get up, get out. Go meet the world head on, folks, no matter how bad it is. I'm gonna tell you something that a lot of people, 99% of people disagree with me. Everybody says, follow your passions. I say that's bullshit, right? I say, follow your efforts. It's amazing how we're all passionate about things. We are all passionate about something, helping veterans, helping this organization, helping this group. That's great. But it, no matter what, it all nets out to where do you put your time? Because when people put in their time, you get better at things. And when you get better at something and get good at something, then you have a chance to be great at something. And you know what I've learned? Nobody ever quits anything they're great at. And once you get great at it, it's amazing how passionate you become about it. Follow your efforts. You are the architect of tomorrow. Sometimes in order to stay on our priority pathway, yeah. you gotta say no. Gotta say no. So I, I've really become a master of saying that's just not working for me. Yeah. But yeah. in years past, yeah. I was too cluttered. So every single organization on the planet, even our own careers, always function on the same three levels. What we do, how we do it, and why we do it. Everybody knows what they do. These are the products we sell, the services we offer. Some know how they do it. These are, the, these are the things we call our unique selling propositions or you know, our differentiating value propositions, whatever it is, the things that we think make us stand out from the crowd. But very, very few people and very, very few organizations can clearly articulate why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make money, that's a result. By why, I mean what is your purpose, what is your cause, what is your belief? Why does your company exist? Why did you get out of bed this morning? And why should anyone care? And what I learned is that organizations or leaders that start with by telling you what they do are less able to inspire people to do business with them, inspire loyalty, where those who start with why, whether it's Steve Jobs or Mahatma Gandhi, are able to command loyalty and are able to uh, innovate in ways that others cannot. And the reason I say that every company functions this way is because the model is not based on highfalutin management theory, it's based on the biology of human decision making. This is how the brain works. That when you start with why, it talks to the part of, brain, of the brain that is responsible for decision making and feelings, like trust and loyalty, but it's not responsible for language, which is why it's hard to put into it. Go meet the world head on. Go meet whatever it is, okay? You gotta make up to somebody. You gotta apologize for something you've done. You gotta make up uh, the damage of, of years of neglect and, and maybe uh, betrayal. And Look, I've done all that. I've had all those things where I screwed up over and over and over again. My reputation sucked. I was 20, between the ages of 15 and 25 years old. It was like I was doing everything I could just to damage damage my reputation okay if it made me look bad i did it so here today i'm gonna spend 10 days 14 days something like that up here with that view you can fix anything i'm proof that you can fix anything anything can be fixed anything can be fixed but you got to fix it you got to fix it you can't just sweep it under the old rug you got to fix it you got to clean up the damage you got to pay the price Clean up your debts. Do what you say you're gonna do. Become the most dependable person in your space. Become the go-to person. Oh, I can put that person on stage and know exactly what they're gonna get for me. I can put that person in the game and I know what play they're gonna run. I can put that person on the floor and I know they're gonna get it done. Be the go-to person. 
you know, th those first couple months, I remember thinking to myself, I'm in business two months now. You know, I, I remember getting to the point where I had $15,000 in sales probably six months into the company and I'm still living in the show and thinking, okay, I can do this, I can do this. And along the way, it was, it was lots of trial and error. You know, there were things that were new to me, things that were terrifying to me, things that would just, I would break out into a sweat. But I always remember going into my customers and just trying to be br brutally honest and say to them, if I can help you, right? If I can bring value, if I can make your company more competitive, more profitable, will you work with me? And you don't have to put money, I'll do the work to prove it. Um, and if I get it done, then we'll, you know, we'll figure it all out, you know, or they agree to a price and then they'll pay it at that point. And one by one, I just kept on making customers happy and lost some, picked, you know, for every one I lost, picked up three. And I got, I was so nervous about the whole thing that, you know, I just, I couldn't imagine slowing down, you know? And so people talk about, you know, life, family, balance. I had none. I mean, I literally remember dating some girl. This is the truth. Um, and it was like, we, we'd been dating a couple of years. Like, Mark, you're so into your work. I mean, I want a picket fence. I want a house. I want kids. You know, I mean, you, it's me or your job. And I was like, or me, and your, me or your company. And I was like, what's your name again? I'm 60 years old. And I, everybody who works for me is younger than me. And they'll tell you, I'll work you up under the table. Vision is an internal thing. Right? It is the world that you want to live in, right? Jobs was the rebel, and he always was against big business. All the visionaries that we know have some sort of personal experience and imagine a world that is different to the one they live in now and will use their businesses to help build that world. That doesn't mean they're the only ones doing it, but what makes them a leader is they're the one leading towards that place. Right? So vision has to come from you. If you're the founder of a company, your business is not the only way you do it. What if you quit your business and start another one? It doesn't matter. They should all be contributing towards this vision. And you're not the only one doing it, but if you're the one preaching it, and you're using your company to advance it, that makes you the leader. That's why everybody copies you. But it's not about anticipating the market trend, which is an interest thing you're asking me. It's got to start with values. The interest comes second. If you're gonna make mistakes in your life, make them fast, right? If you're gonna lose a deal, make them lose the deal fast. If you're not gonna make any money on a deal, make sure the deal's quick. There's part of you that either wants to create a business or you obviously already have created a business. The hardest part is taking that first step, right? There's always that line, like I was talking about earlier, that you have to take a step past. But the thing, people always say, well, you know, you're not afraid to start a business. Why, why aren't you, it's terrifying or, you know, I, I just, it scares me to do it. And my, my attitude has always been, if you're prepared, it's not a risk, right? Bobby Knight, who was the coach at Indiana University, used to say, everybody's got the will to win, but it's only those with the will to prepare that do win. And the same applies to business. We've all seen our friends go out there and just wing it. You know, it's my passion. We're all passionate about something. I'm passionate about basketball. It doesn't make me an NBA player, right? It's not just about passion. It's not just about saying I'm doing it. It's not even about incorporating. It's not about the idea. It's about are you prepared and are you willing to do the work? You gotta quit, you gotta quit saying nonsensical stuff like, you know, I'm happy where I'm at and yeah. we're good, we're all good, you know, this, this, this is good, everything's good, yeah. I'm better off yeah. than somebody in that, you gotta quit yeah. comparing yourself to other people, yeah. you gotta quit talking like the middle class, yeah. like, like you've somehow arrived because somebody in Iran is suffering, yeah. you know, you're good until you're not, there's nobody watching that gives enough money to charity, yeah. okay, everybody watching should be able to give a million dollars a year to charity, but you can't, you know why you can't, you would if you could, but you can't because you didn't, yeah. You didn't produce enough, because by the way, it's not your money anyway. Yeah. Somebody else game. gave you the money, yeah. and you pass it on. Most of you are like, I'm really charitable, I'm really good, but you never do enough. Why? Because you never had enough. Because you didn't produce enough, because you didn't work enough, because you didn't expand enough. So I would just say to people, look, have some loftier goals. You are at your best when you are authentic to your core, and you have to be what you are, not what they call you.
you know, I, 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 I tend to believe that th there's no finality in anything. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, you're, even though we, our lives are finite, life is infinite, you know, life goes on. And, and for me, the goal is not to produce something that has an end point, but to produce something that has momentum that can live on beyond me.